Hello, everybody. This is Roy Flanagan with Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm the Agriculture and Natural Resources Extension Agent in the city of Virginia Beach. I want to introduce our next speaker to you. It's Dr. Edward Derner from Rutgers University. He's going to be presenting on the physiology of the strawberry plant, how to better understand your plants to maximize your yield. Please stay tuned for Dr. Ed. Hello, this is Dr. Ed Derner from the Plant Biology Department at Rutgers University. I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about the flowering physiology of the strawberry. This talk is part of a larger scale project, which is funded by a SARE program, looking at empowering Northeastern strawberry growers with flower mapping. This is a USDA Northeast Region SARE project that Pete Nietzsche and I have going from 2020 through 2023. Basically, the idea is to try to understand from a plant perspective and from a physiological perspective, how to go from this a three week old plug plant or a dormant crown to a field full of strawberries ready for harvest. The answers for how to go from the plant to the harvest all comes down to the meristem. Now, what is a meristem? A meristem is basically a region in a plant where cells grow. These cells divide and then they take on different functions to produce new organs such as leaves or flowers. Now, these meristems develop differently depending upon where they're located on a plant. The two important types of meristems in a strawberry plant are the terminal meristems and the axillary meristem. What we have on the left here is a microscopic shot of a strawberry crown showing the terminal meristem and one of the axillary meristems. To the left you can see a branched crown beginning to form. To the right we have an actual single crown in a pot showing you where the terminal meristem would be located and then axillary meristems are such that the number of leaves that you have on the plant would tell you how many axillary meristems you have there's one axillary meristem in the axle of each leaf but there's only one terminal meristem per crown now that terminal meristem has one of three fates it can remain dormant it can produce leaves or it can become floral. And remember, there's one terminal meristem per crown. Now the axillary meristems, and remember there can be many of them per crown, one in each leaf axle, has a fate of either being remaining dormant or producing two leaf primordia. Thus, it really should be considered a two-node branch crown. Even though it's still microscopic in size, it is a two-node branch crown. Now this two-node branch crown can do basically one of three things. It can remain dormant. Both inner nodes can elongate rather dramatically, and that's what produces the runner. Now, if it doesn't remain dormant or it doesn't produce a runner, basically you've got this two-node branch crown. Now, in order to look at that two-node branch crown's fate a little bit more closely, we look at what happens to the meristems that are located on that two-node branch crown. Since it's a two-node crown, it has one terminal meristem and two axillary meristems, one axillary meristem at each node. Now the terminal meristem of that branch crown with two nodes can remain dormant, it can produce an inflorescence, or it can produce a few leaves and then an inflorescence. And the axillary meristems can either stay dormant or produce a two node branch crown, just as before on the main crown. Now that two node branch crown can either remain dormant, the two inner nodes can elongate and produce a runner, or 
it can remain as a two node branch crown which then sort of starts this circle all over again because that two node branch crown itself will have a terminal meristem and two axillary meristems each of which can undergo the fate destined for either a terminal or an axillary meristems so you see you get kind of get this circular growth pattern where you can get this continual branching further and further and further along such that the process continues over and over again now this process of branching can continue to produce a plant that has many branch crowns and remember each branch crown has terminal and axillary meristems the axillary meristems can become a runner stay dormant or produce a branch crown with two or more nodes and possibly an inflorescence ideally what you want is a plant with one main crown and probably anywhere from five to six branches now remember flowers always will form from a terminal meristem either the terminal meristem of the main crown or that terminal meristem of the axillary meristem they might appear to be axillary in origin these inflorescences simply because the branch crown is so small when it's only a two node branch crown it really doesn't look like a branch crown it looks like that inflorescence is coming directly from an axillary position but there's been a tremendous amount of anatomical work done especially in Europe to show that all inflorescences on a cultivated strawberry come from a terminal meristem so what controls the development of these meristems basically it's controlled by both genetics and environment genetics would indicate what type of cultivar they are and traditionally we've had June bearing ever bearing and day neutral cultivars and the environmental cues include primarily photo period and temperature now I would suggest that we don't use those terms June bearer ever bearers and day neutral anymore because there's been enough evidence in the scientific literature to indicate that we essentially have two types of strawberry we have short day cultivars and long day cultivars our commercial strawberry cultivars are either short day or long day there are some day neutrals in breeding material but I think for all intents and purposes we should start calling our cultivars short day or long day and I think that really simplifies understanding the flowering physiology of the strawberry and it also makes a discussion of what we're talking about a lot easier um, if you look in catalogs you see terms such as uh, recurrent flowering remontant ever bearing day neutral June bearing and it can become very confusing very quickly when we limit it to short and long day cultivars it's a lot easier to understand flowering physiology can be subdivided into four main stages the first stage induction occurs in the leaf tissue of plants when the plant senses the photo period or temperature that signals a transition from vegetative to floral meristems once this signal which is actually a protein that's produced in the leaf is translocated and is received at the meristem once that signal is received at the meristem we say that we have initiation when the different parts of an individual flower or different flowers of an individual inflorescence begin to develop we say that's differentiation and finally the step where we're actually seeing a macroscopically produced flower cluster in the field we say that's floral development now these four stages can each differentially be affected by photo period and temperature now let's look at short day cultivars first most of our commercial strawberry cultivars are short day cultivars now in short day cultivars this means that in order for floral induction or initiation to occur the day length has to be shorter than some defined critical value 
this critical value will start to get shorter and shorter as the temperature increases. So remember, short day cultivar means in order to get initiation or induction to occur, you need days that are shorter than a described critical photo period. And as the temperature gets water, that photo period becomes shorter and shorter. Now what that critical photo period is, is normally determined through growth chamber experiments for different cultivars. It can vary from cultivar to cultivar, but the key point is to remember that you need a day length shorter than a critical photo period. Actual development of those clusters occurs under long days. Now another important thing to remember with short day cultivars is that shortening days and warm temperatures puts a strawberry plant into a semi-dormant state. Now this is a little bit confusing to some folks because a lot of times I think we're, we're taught that dormancy is caused by shortening days and cooler temperatures in the fall. But with strawberries, strawberries are a little bit different. Strawberries, it's actually short days and warm temperatures that make them go semi-dormant. And that dormancy is removed with exposure to chilling. Now a, a strawberry scientist by the name of Gutridge did the work that really showed this pretty pretty nicely back in the 1940s and 50s. A final consideration for short day cultivars is that after chilling, short day cultivars normally do not initiate more flower buds. That basically means that after the winter, during the spring, short day cultivars do not initiate more flower buds in the spring. Now, if we look at long day cultivars, a long day cultivar is a cultivar where in order to get induction or initiation to occur, day lengths have to be longer than a defined critical value. Now, what that value is varies again with cultivar to cultivar and a classic long day cultivar would be Albion or Seascape. Uh, Tribute TriStar, the first two day neutrals in the East back in the 1970s. They're both really long day cultivars. Um, in order to get flower buds to form, the days have to be longer than a critical value. Cluster development also occurs under long days. Now, the important other important thing to remember with a long day cultivar is that this critical value becomes longer and longer as the temperature increases. So where with a short day cultivar, the critical photo period became shorter and shorter as temperatures increased. With long day cultivars, this critical photo period becomes longer and longer as the temperature increase. I have a couple of graphs in a little bit that'll help really clarify this, I think. Now, just as in the short day cultivars, short days and warm temperatures put the plants into a semi-dormant dormant state, which much must be removed with chilling, or in some cases, long days can substitute for chilling. But the important thing to remember about the long day and short day cultivars is um, the critical photo period, whether the, it needs to be shorter or longer for flower formation, and what happens to that critical photo period as the temperature changes. Now, in both types of cultivars, there is what's called a quantitative aspect and a qualitative aspect of flowering. And I think the easiest way to think of this is a quantitative response is very much like a dimmer switch. And the quantitative response is, for example, for a short day cultivar, is that the shorter the days or the more short day cycles you give them, the more intense the flowering response will be. Now, a qualitative aspect would be where it's like an on-off switch that either it flowers or it doesn't. And depending upon what temperature you're at, both short day and long day cultivars have both qualitative and quantitative aspects and responses to photo period. And we'll see what they are in just a bit. I think this graph will help shed some light on what I've been trying to describe a little bit in the previous couple of slides. Um, 
on the y-axis you'll see I have indicated day length. Um, there's no specific day length that's really relative and you don't need a specific day length to understand the concepts presented in this graph. At the top we have long days and at the bottom of the y-axis we have short days. Along the bottom x-axis we have temperature ranging from 50 up to around 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The line that you see with the red dots is an indication of the critical photo period. The first thing I want you to notice is notice how beginning at around 60 degrees up to around 80 that photo period be starts to become shorter and shorter and shorter. That's the response that I was talking about that short day cultivars have that as the temperature increases the critical photo period becomes shorter. Notice that below around 60 degrees Fahrenheit the cultivars are essentially insensitive to photo period with respect to flower formation. This just means that at basically any photo period if the temperature is below around 60 you'll get flower formation. Between 60 and 70 degrees approximately you have the quantitative response meaning that the shorter the day length or the greater the number of short day cycles the plants receive, the more intense the flowering response will be. And that's the quantitative response, kind of like that dimmer switch. Between 70 and 80, we switch into the qualitative mode, where it's kind of like that on-off switch, that the day lengths have to be shorter than that critical photo period to get the flower response to get flower induction or initiation. So it's an absolute short day requirement for flowering. Once you get to around 80, many of our short day cultivars will not form flower buds under um, any short day photo period. So again, notice that flowering is more intense at the shorter photo periods and the critical photo period decreases become shorter as the temperature increases from around 60 up to around 80, above which the flowering process essentially shuts off in short day cultivars. And notice that the temperature at which they switch from being mostly quantitative in their response to qualitative in their response is around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Now if we look at long day cultivars, we kind of see just the opposite occurring. Um, anywhere below 60, again, we're, we're photo period insensitive. When we st go between maybe 60 and 80, we're getting really a quantitative response to flowering. That the longer the days are, or the more cycles that the plant receives, the greater the intensity of flower formation will be. At around 80 degrees, long day cultivars make that switch to qualitative rather than quantitative. And it's in this temperature range um, above 80, usually between 80 and 85, that it's an absolute requirement for long days. If you don't get the long day, and in most long day cultivars, the critical photo period is around 15 hours. If you don't get that 15 hour long day, you're not going to get flower formation if the temperature is above around 80. That's really the reason why many of the long day cultivars don't perform very well in the mid-Atlantic during the hot summer months is because the day lengths aren't long enough. Our longest day at around 40 degrees uh, north latitude is 15 hours, almost 15 hours on the dot. So after June 21st, the days start getting shorter and shorter. So when we're getting into the hottest months of the summer, July, August, and early September, our day lengths are not sufficiently long to cause flower formation in long day cultivars. And that's why they shut down in the summertime. If you could give them days that are long enough during those hot temperatures, you would actually get flower formation. And that's exactly what um, I've been able to show that you can do using um, holiday lights, Christmas tree lights, 
in the field during the hot midsummer if you give them an artificial long day they will form flower buds even under very high temperatures but again right here what i'd like you to to remember with the long day cultivars is that as the temperature gets warmer and warmer the day length needed to cause flower formation in a long day cultivar gets longer and longer also notice the switch from quantitative to qualitative occurs at around 80 degrees if you remember in short day cultivars which is the graph on the left it was around 70 degrees and again in long day cultivars it's around 80 degrees so i know this is a lot of information in a short time but i think if you look at these graphs a little bit more and you just let it sink in what i'm trying to show with these graphs i think it'll help you really clarify the difference between short day and long day cultivars and their flowering response and if you understand their flowering responses then you'll understand how a lot of the different things you do in the field can make a difference in your ultimate productivity that you get from these different cultivars some other responses with strawberry to photo period include runner production in short day cultivars runners are normally enhanced with long days and high temperatures but in long day cultivars it's just the opposite it's really short days that cause runnering in long day cultivars but high temperatures can override that photo period response so you can get um, runner production during the summer because of the heat but the photo period response is actually the opposite for than it is for flowering in both cultivars uh, with short day cultivars short days promote flower formation and long days promote runner production in long day cultivars long days promote flower formation and short days promote runner formation now branch crown formation which is important particularly in the plastic culture system in the fall particularly with short day cultivars is um, governed or regulated by photo period and in short day cultivars branch crown formation occurs when the days are too short for runnering but too long for flower formation so there's a narrow window in there where you get um, axillary buds tend to form branch crowns and it's a that's that's really the reason why planting date is so critical for the plastic culture system because you want to get those plugs into the field so they have enough time to form branch crowns before flower formation Occurs. now in long day cultivars branch crown formation occurs when the days are too long for runnering but too short for flower formation so essentially in the strawberry plants you can either have vegetative floral branch crown or runnering and they're all controlled by photo period and temperature and the response depends upon whether you're looking at a short day or a long day cultivar And this just summarizes what I was speaking about in the previous slide. So what's the physiological mechanism? What controls this whole process in a plant? And it's a pigment called phytochrome in the plant. Phytochrome is a substance in, in a plant that absorbs light, much like chlorophyll is um, a pigment in the plant that absorbs light for photosynthesis phytochrome is a pigment in the plant that absorbs light to regulate photoperiod responses um, phytochrome has two different forms one called phytochrome red which is indicated with the uppercase p and a lowercase r and this form of phytochrome absorbs red light which is around 660 nanometers now phytochrome far red is the other form indicated uppercase p lowercase fr 
it absorbs far red light, which is around 730 nanometers. And they are two distinct molecular forms of phytochrome. Now, before we get into how it works, uh, photoperiod is the term that describes uh, the light period, and nictoperiod is the technical term that should be used to describe the dark period, so that any response that we call a photoperiodic response is really a response to the nictoperiod, not necessarily the photoperiod. But that makes everything kind of confusing. So we're going to continue to use the term photoperiod. Um, in this discussion. But remember that it's really the dark period that's regulating the photoperiodic response that we see. Now here's a, a diagram that shows you phytochrome in the red form on the left, phytochrome in far red on the right. When phytochrome red absorbs red light, it magically turns into phytochrome far red. And when phytochrome far red absorbs far red light, it magically turns back into phytochrome red. So that's a pretty neat type of mechanism that the two different forms exist depending upon what color light or what the predominant color of light falling on the leaf, which is where most of your phytochrome is located. That governs what type of phytochrome is most prevalent in the tissue. So they switch back and forth between these two forms. Now in the dark, when there is no light, that phytochrome far red slowly decays back to phytochrome red. And the thing to remember is that the photoperiodic response that a plant has relies on how much phytochrome far red remains at the end of a dark period. That's what's regulating that photoperiodic response, such as flowering, that you see in the plant. How much phytochrome far red is in that plant relative to how much phytochrome red is there at the end of the dark period. Now to show you how it works, sunlight is rich in red light. There's a little bit more red light um, than far red, so that at the end of the day, most of your phytochrome is in phytochrome in the far red form. Now, once the sun goes down and it's dark, that phytochrome far red begins to decay back to phytochrome or convert. I shouldn't necessarily say decay all the time, but it is converted back to phytochrome red. If the night is really long, this is a short, that means a short day plant, there's going to be very little phytochrome far red at the end of that dark period. If the night's very short, which would occur during the summertime, there's going to be a lot of that phytochrome far red left at the end of the dark period. So to get a photoperiodically long day response, you need to have a lot of phytochrome far red at the end of the dark period. To get a short day response, you generally need to have a very low amount of phytochrome far red. And remember, it's the amount of phytochrome far red at the end of the dark period that determines the photoperiodic response. Short day plants need low phytochrome far red at the end of the night to flower, and long day plants need high phytochrome far red at the end of the night to flower. Now there's a technique that's often used in horticulture, not only with strawberries, but for a lot of different floricultural crops called the night interruption technique. And I include it here because it's um, a very useful horticultural tool and it fits right in with the phytochrome. Um, and it's a technique that allows you to simulate a long day during a naturally short day. So during the fall, winter, and spring, when you need a longer day length, but you don't want to use sodium vapor or other very expensive light sources. If the response you're looking at is a true photoperiodic response, that is a response that depends upon the dark period, the length of the dark period, I mean, you can use this night interruption technique and it will cause a long day response. 
So it's a, it's a technique that's used to, quote, trick the plants into thinking they're under a long day when they're really under a naturally short day, such as during the winter. How does it work? Well, it leads back to phytochrome. Here you are of phytochrome status at the end of the day because of the amount of light that's in the, in the sun. You got mostly phytochrome far red and it starts to uh, undergo dark reversion back to phytochrome in the red form. And that's what's occurring here. And it's a slow process. I forgot to mention that a little bit earlier. The process uh, with red and far red light is much, it's, it's instantaneous, but the reversion during the dark is a slower process. Now, if you come in uh, with some red light, which incandescent bulbs have a good deal of red light in them, any phytochrome red that is formed by this dark reversion process will be immediately switched back to phytochrome far red. So you've got phytochrome far red decay, de, decaying, reverting back to phytochrome red. You hit it with red light that phytochrome red is going to go back to phytochrome far red. Now, the important thing, besides using the right color of light, is when do you give that light, the timing of this interruption. And the timing, besides the light color, is crucial. If you come in too early, what will happen is that even though you will convert the phytochrome red back to phytochrome far red, there will be plenty of time during the dark period for that phytochrome far red to decay to phytochrome red, and the level of phytochrome far red will be very low at the end of the dark period. And if you come in too late, enough phytochrome far red may have decayed such that you've reached a level that you get a short day response. So in order to get that long day response, generally we center the exposure to the red light during the middle of the dark period um, and have the, the red light exposure for about three hours right in the middle of the dark period. And that usually is the correct timing to provide a long day response. So when we've been using uh, night interruption to promote a long day response in strawberries, we generally tend to put the incandescent lights on for uh, three hours during the middle of the dark period. Another technique that is uh, used, that we've used in the field for um, simulating a night interruption effect is to have the incandescent lights on for 15 minutes every hour from sunset to sunrise. Now the big, big thing to remember if you use night interrup interruption technique is do not leave the incandescent lights on 24 hours a day because this causes a very strange response in many different plants. There has to be that cyclic nature of the 15 minutes every hour from sunset to sunrise or just the simple interrupt the night with uh, three hours right in the middle. Now why is strawberry flowering seemingly so complicated? I think just remember that you're dealing with a very complicated genetic composition. Strawberries, cultivated strawberries are octoploids. We have a number of different production systems that are used, many different cultivars, many different plant types, plant sources, and plant age that you can get to put in the systems um, during their propagation or during the nursery exposure or wherever these plants are being obtained from. They could have undergone different photoperiod temperature interactions. Uh, they may have been in the cooler for a long time, a short time, and they have different planting dates. So all these different factors kind of go into showing you why flowering can be so complicated.
in strawberries. So what should you do to try to maximize your productivity? I think first you need to know the production system that you're working with, understand the cultivars, whether they're short day or long day cultivars that you're working with, consider your plant type, where you got them and how they were treated both at the nursery or your source and during transit and once you get them. And then also finally, understand your own skill level. Do you have the skills it takes to go with more complicated systems or should you rely on less complicated systems? It's all your own choice and your decision to make. But let's take a look at some of the different factors that enter into the plasticulture system that really are directly related to flowering physiology. So you can see where the basic science we just covered fits in with real production out in the field. Some of the components that I've been looking at at Rutgers with the plasticulture system include cultivar, planting date, nitrogen timing, particularly in fall planted short day cultivars, and also summer production of long day cultivars, particularly looking at nitrogen timing and flower formation, mulch color, and also row cover management. The timing of nitrogen greatly affects flower formation in both long and short day cultivars. If nitrogen is provided about a week or so before the signal for making the transition from vegetative to floral is perceived by the plant, you can actually reduce the intensity of flower formation in those plants. If you give nitrogen just after this initiation process has begun, which you would be able to detect with flower mapping, you can enhance your floral formation, and in some cases greatly enhance floral formation. If you wait too long after that trigger has been perceived by the plants, you won't be able to really do much with your flowering. It really has no effect. So it's really crucial to know when your plants have switched from being vegetative to floral, because if they haven't become floral yet, you don't want to give them nitrogen. Once they become fl floral, if you know that they just became floral, giving them additional nitrogen can greatly enhance flowering and fruiting. If they became floral several weeks ago, additional nitrogen isn't really going to impact flowering. So being able to tell when your plants have gone from vegetative to floral is pretty important. And that's one of the things that we're going to try to do with our SARE project is to teach you how to detect this switch, how to flower map your plants. And that'll be coming a little bit later in this presentation, a description of the program we have set up. Another area that I've investigated is the effect of mulch color on Albion, a long day cultivar productivity. We looked at seven different mulch colors. It's hard to see seven different colors in this photo, but we did have seven different colors. And if you look at the several of the, the plots, you can see red fruit on them. But what we found was that mulch color can affect the temperature of the microclimate around the plant. It can affect the amount of photosynthetically active radiation reflected back onto the plant. But I think one of the big things it does for long day cultivars, it alters the ratio of red to far red light reflected back onto the plant. For example, just separating these mulch colors, just looking at three of them, where we found the biggest differences in yield, if we look at black and then white and silver, the white and silver reflect quite a bit more photosynthetically active radiation back onto the plant. The yield per plant is much higher with white or silver mulch. But when you look at the phytochrome far red to red ratio, now that's the actual phytochrome, not the, the, the light color. It's the phytochrome status. Notice that the ratio of far red to red under or on plants that are growing over white or silver mulch 
is higher than on black mulch. So you've got more far red phytochrome than you have red phytochrome, which is going to elicit a stronger long day response, therefore stronger flowering and ultimately more fruiting with um, Albion, a long day cultivar. We don't really like the silver mulch, mulch that much because it can get incredibly hot with the reflected light off of it. It starts to discolor very quickly in the late summer and it's also much more expensive than the white mulch. So if you're going to try to grow Albion, I think you might want to um, consider white mulch because it has a number of benefits. We've also not really looked at this that much, but you really need to consider what type of plant you're using in your system. Are you getting runner tips and creating your own plugs? Are you buying plugs? Are you trying to use dormant crowns, which you might use with long day cultivars planted in the spring? Or are you using freshly dug plants or cutoffs? All these different types of plants have different things that you need to be thinking about when you are using them. Um, particularly runner tips and plugs if you're going to be um, creating your own plugs or buying plugs. Um, if you know the floral status of them, you'll know how to treat them once they get into the field. Are they floral yet? Or are they not? If they're not, then you want to be able to detect when they become floral once you put them in the field so you can uh, know when to add some nitrogen if you need to. So you also need to think about what the status of these plants were in terms of how they've been handled. Have they been put in a cooler? How long? What temperature? When they were shipped? Were they shipped on a hot truck? Were they shipped on a refrigerated truck? So there are a lot of different things that you really need to think about when you're buying your plant material. You really need to make sure that you have the correct planting date for plug plants in the plastic culture system based upon whatever cultivar you're working with, because you want to plant them late enough in the late summer, early fall, so that few runners are formed, but early enough so that you get branch crown formation. Again, you want a main crown plus five or six branches or so. Um, and you want those plants to be in the field for a long enough time so that they form branch crowns before setting flower buds. If you put them out too early, so they have too long in the field before flower formation, you'll get way too many branches. So you'll end up with a lot of fruit, but they'll be really small. If you put them out too late, you're not going to get enough branch crown formation before you get floral formation. And then what you're going to have is you might have some nice large fruit, but you're not going to get very much of it. So that's the idea is that you want to get them so that you get the branch crown formation. And once you get your branch crown formations, then you can go on to step three, where you get floral formation in the terminal meristem of all your crowns. You also should be concerned about row cover management in the fall. Oftentimes row covers are applied to short day cultivars say in mid-October when the temperatures are uh, fairly warm. And what this does is it tends to encourage branch crown formation. If you see that you're not getting enough branch crowns formed and you're afraid that you're starting to get into that period when you're going to start seeing flower buds form, if you put row covers over them, you're going to delay uh, flower bud formation because you're going to require shorter days due to the elevated temperature under the row covers and you're using and because you're using short day cultivars. If you go back to the graphs I showed you earlier, remember that as the temperatures are warmer, you require a shorter day for flower formation. So ultimately what you're doing is you're putting the row cover on so that you are in essence preventing flower formation for a couple of weeks so that maybe you can get some additional branch crown formation. Um, you need to be able to figure out do you have flower buds formed or not to see whether you should be trying to force more branch crowns. So again, it brings back the whole idea of if you can detect whether you have flower buds or not, that gives you a very powerful tool to know how to manage your row covers. It's also giving you an idea of how to manage your nitrogen. 
and it also allows you to find out what the responses are with different cultivars you might try. The one thing you need to be uh, concerned with a little bit is that remember that short days and warmer temperatures can put your strawberry plants into uh, semi-dormancy. So you, you have to be thinking about that, but um, I don't think that that's really a big issue with row cover management. I think it's more of um, can you put the row covers on to induce a few more branch crowns before you get floral formation. So to this end, I would like to introduce our USDA SARE project, Empowering Northeastern Strawberry Growers with Flower Mapping. Even though the title does say Northeastern Strawberry Growers, I think it's a project that's important enough to consider allowing growers from other regions to participate, especially regions that are so close to the Northeast, which would include um, Mid-Atlantic and Southeastern growers. Basically, this project has two major components. The first is flowering and fruiting research, where we're looking at, in particular, nitrogen fertilization and row cover management at both our Cream Ridge and our Snyder research farms. And the second component is teaching growers how to flower map via workshops or virtual demonstrations. So you ask, what is flower mapping? Flower mapping involves dissecting a strawberry plant using a microscope to determine whether or not your plants have set flower buds. Why might you want to know this? Knowing when flower buds have formed will allow you to optimize fall planting dates for plasticulture, better manage nitrogen fertilization, and improve row cover management for optimum crown branching. In other words, it'll help you get from this to this. Who is this project for? The project is designed for plasticultural strawberry growers in particular, but matted row, high tunnel, low tunnel, or greenhouse growers could benefit as well. The project is open to all strawberry growers in the Northeast region. However, our workshops will be limited in size. Growers from other regions will be considered as space permits. During the workshops, you will be taught simple flower mapping. We then would like you to implement the technique on your farm. You will be provided the dissecting scope and kit at no cost, and you can keep it when the project is complete. The scope is capable of taking pictures, thus you can email photos to us and we will help in interpretation and production suggestions based on your flower maps. Participation will require about an hour or so per week from August through December after your training session for flower mapping and consultation. You will be expected to submit yield data and to evaluate effectiveness of the technique and to provide feedback regarding this project. The most important aspect of the project is that you will have a new tool with which to make management decisions. With flower mapping, you will know the floral or vegetative status of your plants at different stages during the production cycle, and management decisions will be based on this knowledge, not on calendar dates or guesses. If you're interested, please contact me and you will be emailed an application and brief questionnaire. My email address is presented here. Workshop space is limited to 25 participants for each workshop, so please, the sooner you can contact us, the better. Here is a short video showing you actual flower mapping in action. That um, knife blade that you see there is the tip of an X-Acto knife, and I apologize for the sort of shakiness of the video, 
but that just goes with the territory of uh, trying to dissect the tip of a strawberry plant. Um, the video is about two minutes long or so, but it's showing you what you would learn how to do underneath a little digital microscope that you'd be sent. Um, just takes a little practice, and once you get the hang of it, it's not as difficult as you might think. Uh, steady hand, and here you're seeing I'm pushing back one of the leaf tissues, and there you see another leaf towards the background when it's in focus, and there you see right in the center, right there, there's a flower bud. I'm going to clean it up a little bit more so you'll be able to see a little more closely. And this is where it gets tricky, so you want to make sure you don't cut off that flower if you want to get a little closer look. But I'm removing, you can see the leaflets right there that I just pressed away and pushed off. And now there is the flower bud. You see the king flower right in the middle. There's a little three leaflet leaf primordia right there at the tip right there. Now we get rid of that as well. We'll push it up not get rid of it but now see as you, as you see the inflorescence is kind of broken off with that leaf primordia but you get a general idea of what you're able to accomplish by learning how to flower map and there you have it there you can see the king flower you can or primary flower and then you see a secondary down on the side So I thank you for your time and patience, and I hope this presentation has helped you out in understanding your strawberry plant, its flowering physiology, and how flower mapping might help you become a better grower. Thank you very much.